Welcome, everyone. Thank God that again we are good to go and thank Him that He has enabled us to be fine. You see, there, are, there has been a lot of colds and um, coughs around, but we are hanging in there. My voice is not so good, but I'll try to to keep in and I'll pray that God may help me. There's a lot of, there's some time, there's some kind of coughing here and there, but I think we shall go on. We are, we are on a very sensitive topic. I wonder, such sensitive topics when it comes to the, to the law of God, this is, uh, this is when people totally don't look at these lectures. In fact, one of the issues that will, will prove the end time is that the commandments of God are going to be the issue at hand. And it is interesting that very few people will be interested in such topics. That's why in churches you don't find the law of God talked about, in the synagogues, in the meetings, very little about the law of God. Yet this is the standard. This is this is the, the, the government, the, the, the constitution of this government. And once we don't understand it, then how can we live in that government? It is very, very hard for us to be in that government. So let's pray and we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you for the masses that you have given, that you have always accorded upon us. Thank you for another time you have given us right now to share your word. Please speak to your people through me, because the subject we are handling is a hard one, and it required you to write it yourself with your hand. You wrote it down every time you wrote down, you wrote your law. When you wrote it on Mount Sinai, there was a fire on the mountain that no animal or human being could get close and not get burnt. So I pray that as you write these laws, in our hearts to understand them, we pray that come and cool our lives, that we may be able to contain the fire that comes from your law. Help us to understand them and, and help us to share it with others. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> what is this first commandment? Let's read it. Exodus 20, verse 2 and 3. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now, you will notice that in every lecture about the commandments you're going to have uh, in this series, mini-series of the Ten Commandments, every one of them shall be having, I am the Lord thy God, because that's the introduction. So, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Every one of the commandments must have, I am the Lord thy God which brought thee. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee. This should be always airing in the hearts of, of, of everyone as I think that we should all know that it should be part of the commandments. So, the first one says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That is the first one. Why does God start with, Thou shalt have no other gods before me? Now, first of all, each commandment starts with Thou. Thou is singular. Ye is plural in the King James Version. So, here we are talking about, a, is, God is talking about Always talking to an individual, thou, you, one person, she shall not have no other gods before me. So, first of all, thou shall have no other gods before me. You, as an individual, think about it. This is a personal issue, it's not a group issue. Secondly, it says, uh, have no other. God. That means th they can be existing, but you should have no other. 
when I'm around, before me. So if I'm your God, the God's before me. So the word before means in my presence. So if I'm the one you have chosen to be your God, then better not bring any other before me. Deuteronomy 22, 3. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. So if you have chosen me as your God, please do not put any other. Now, in this verse itself, there's something that shows that once you say, uh, you, you shall, once it says, thou shall have no other, none other, or no other gods before me, that means they exist. They can be there, and you can make them gods, and they're small g. That's one. Two, there will be a mindset of putting them together. Since you ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it is always <coughs> a desire to put good and evil together. So you can put me, God, who is good, and then you put others who are evil together. So in others, you shall have no other gods before me. This is a, a battle for not putting good and evil together. If you bring this together, there's a problem. So this is interesting that the, 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 the first thing God talks about is unit, is bringing together God and anything else. It's, it's interesting that because you cannot have the other one alone. No, you shall have no other gods before me. So once you bring me in, then don't bring any other. Okay, so that means the desire to merge two things together, good and evil, uh, being lukewarm, you want to be not hot, not cold, that mindset, don't bring it. It is a call to being with God alone. Psalms 96, 4 to 6. For the Lord is great and greatly greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. That means they are there because already we are in the world of sin and, and already we have another enemy who wants to be God because he said, I will be like the most high. So, only God, the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. So all the rest, idols, don't bring the idols. There's only the creator is God. The Lord made the heavens. So in his, uh, in his godness, he, or in he, being God, he, he made the heaven. So that is part of what makes him God. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. So look at what he designs. Honor and majesty. These move with anything called God. So if you make anything God, that means there will be honor and there will be majesty. <clears throat> There will be strength and there will be beauty. But can these others have them? They are idols. They cannot. Baal, at the time of Elijah, could not have all these. So if you desire to make this, just move to all the temples in the world, as we are going to see, move to the temples in the world where they put, where they serve other gods, and you notice that they make these, these places very beautiful, but it is not God, their God that makes those places beautiful, but it is the people who make the majesty and the beauty and, and the fear of these things that, that people would fear them and claim them to be God. But they are not. So it is the people that work to, to make, to form this to be existing, but, but God, their God is not the one. 
but here God made the heavens, put everything in place. He he made the fear of him in our hearts such that we can tremble before him. But the other gods cannot do that. So if you bring anything closer to him, then you claim they are the, your, they are the creators of you and the creators of heaven. That is very evil to do. Isaiah 17, 9 to 11. Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation. Now we have another one here. He's the God of salvation. That's why he started, I am the Lord thy God which brought thee. In other words, there is no other God who brought thee out of Egypt except this God. So this is a God of salvation. He saved you from Egypt from the land of bondage and brought you. No other God has ever done that. Because thou hast forgotten that the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Okay? So there is a rock of strength. Therefore shall thou plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. In the day, in the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in the morn, morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish, but the harvest shall be hid in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. So if you forget this salvation, whatever you will do is a waste. It will be grief. And when we're studying the third angel's message, it tells us there that they will be they will cry the wrath of god will go upon all those who will worship the beast they don't worship god so they will they, they will be in grief and desperate and sorrowful and if you read uh, in parables of jesus every time they would mention that uh they threw the man and bind him together and throw him where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that is grief and sorrow. So in other words, God is saying that where I am, if you put me first and you make me your God and don't bring anyone else, then all these will not come to you. And that's why it, this message is very connected to the three angels' message. Going back to the standard. What else makes him God? Mark 2, 7. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now, since he's the God of salvation, he saved you from what? From sin. So how does he save you from sin? By forgiving you your sins. So salvation ends with removing sin from you. So if you forget that God of your salvation, then you will heap up with your sins. Only God can forgive sins. Why? Because only him you offended. So the only one who can forgive sin is one who has offended. So since we offended that God who created us, only him are we able to confess that he can forgive us. For example, can if I slap someone, uh, can I go and apologize to someone else to forgive me instead of apologizing to the one I've slapped? Of course it is possible. The one who has received the, 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 the slap should be the one to, to forgive. So since, we, since he's the one we offended, it is him to forgive us. So if you make any any other God, you bring him, that means that God can forgive your sins. That tells you that where we are going, if anyone claims to forgive sin, then he is another God. He is another God. Matthew nineteen seventeen, And he saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. God only is good. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So 
recommends him to the commandment. But look at this point. Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. So all goodness is for God. None of us is good. God is good and is good all the time. Mark 2, sorry. Uh, uh, this verse was supposed to be uh, Matthew 23. Sorry, Matthew 23. Uh, let's start from verse 6. And, lo and love the uppermost rooms at feasts. They're talking to the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets, and to be called men, rabbi, rabbi. But be, ye call, be, be not ye called rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Now we had a lecture about the, the, the battle within and uh, in, the, in the Jewish camp. It was very uh, interesting, and that's why many of these lectures were removed or we were hidden on YouTube, we saw that the, the, the rabbi is connected to master. Because what only one who can teach you can be a master. And we saw people being called masters and guides and master guides. But only we are all brethren. None can be the rabbi or can be the master. Only Christ is the master and he is the teacher. We are learning of him. We are learning of Christ because he is, he is our teacher. We are, we are looking upon him, the author, the finish of our faith. So if there is anyone else who teaches you salvation other than Christ, and then that person makes himself Christ. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Okay? So, God, who is our Father in heaven, is the only one who is worthy to be called Father, because the word Father itself means the, the originator, the, the beginner, or the one who founded things. That's why we can use the term like, uh, we can use terms like the, the Father of Science, the Father of Mathematics, the Father of thing, uh, Engineering, technology or the father of medicine meaning the originator the one who started from the idea came so if they should so what I was saying that every thing we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God we make it a God so let it be, be it work, children, family, whatever, call it anything, it is a God. And God gave that as the first commandment, which means he knows that is the first thing Satan will attack. Blessing anything in, uh, that lessens your love and service to God. So if you are to deal with God first, then you place something else Maybe you, you like to, to give uh, a tithe or you like to give a fast fruit or you like to give something for God. But you say, I think this thing should wait. Let me first deal with this one. That is breaking the first commandment according to this. Patriarchs and Prophets, 305, paragraph 4. Jehovah, the eternal, self-existent, and created one, himself, the source and sustain of all, is alone entitled, entitled to supreme reverence and worship. Man is forbidden to give to any other object the first place in his affections or his service. So God should take first place. The first commandment talks, talks about giving God the first affection, first place in affection and service. So if you are moving somewhere and 
and God gives you a call and you continue and you don't you put God later, please. That is breaking the first commandment. And one day God will put you aside. It means to, to give someone another place, not the first one. Always as parents, we are very, very bitter when you tell a child, do this, and it first goes and says, um, let me first finish this. You, you feel so bad because you want to get the first place. When you say this, they should do it. But how come we do the same to God? Man is forbidden to give any other object the first place in his affection or his service. Whatever we cherish that tends to lessen our love for God or to interfere with the service due to him of that do we make fast not anything else. The service. So if he calls and says, please this is a uh, I need in this week, uh, I would say, oh, excuse me, uh, work is calling me. No, does God know that the, the very first thing Satan will do is always to take out God's place in our hearts? Yes, that's why he gave this as the first commandment because he knows the very thing that Satan wants is to be first in everything, to take away the devotion that would be to, to the Creator and take it to something else. So, you may not go to the shrine, you may not worship anywhere, but the moment you give first place to something else in the place of, instead of giving it to God, then there you are making, you're having other gods before him. Okay. Is there a war against this very commandment? This is a Catechism of the Catholic Church. The web is here. You can always go. The, the links are there to go and prove because some people think that my sources are obscure. But you can go and look. Uh, part 3, Life in Christ, Section 2, The Ten Commandments. And here they show you in Exodus how they are. And here in Deuteronomy, we shall always be looking at them to compare. Now, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. It continues even here, but in the traditional catechical formula, the one in the catechism says, I am the Lord your God. You shall have, you shall not have strange gods before me. And the G is capital. See, it's small. Gods before me here, gods. Who said, ye shall be as gods? This is why this system is really evil. How can you say, I am the Lord your God? You shall have no, you shall have, you shall not have strange gods before me. This statement itself tells you that the I am the Lord your God only. They have removed who brought you out of Egypt. Why have they removed it? Because this is a God of salvation, a unique God. But since you are going into ecumenism, where I would like to bring all the other gods who even never brought anyone from Egypt, then better remove that part. Then you shall have, you shall not have strange gods. So there are gods which are not strange to him, uh, like Jupiter, like Mars, like uh, Teuton, like other gods. Those are not strange. You can bring them in. Let's see what really this means in a catechism. So the catechism of the Catholic religion, uh, translated from the German, uh, but of the, Re the Reverend Joseph uh, de Habi, Society of Jesus, that is the Jesuit. So Jesuit translated this. Let's see what it really means. Because these are the intellectuals of the church, <coughs> the one that run the doctrines of the church.
they talk about they are men you can God we honor God outwardly. We honor God outwardly when we attend religious services by kneeling in prayer care. So here is an outward expression of religion, not inside. Know this that religion is both when Christ came, put religion inside. He said, even if you look at her, the woman. To last upon her, you have already committed adultery. Now, but if you look here, now they are taking it outside. That's why you find many uh, people in the Catholic religion, all of them going and bowing because they, they have told they have been told that by doing this, you show reverence. But Jesus said, the time is coming when you shall worship not in a place or in, in anywhere, worship the Father, but you worship in the spirit and in truth. We had a lecture about worship. I'm not going back into those. How do we sin against the outward worship of God? So there's an outward worship of God. So how do we sin against that outward worship of God? Look at this. By neglecting to attend divine service. Boom. So if you don't go in divine service, this is a catechism. I wonder where such words came from, divine service. If you don't attend divine service or by not behaving reverently when we are present. So there is a service called divine service and in that service it's supposed to show reverence and and you know you, you, you show that the Lord is in his holy temple and you kneel and you know you know you, that is a moment of silence that God only is coming at that divine attend divine service. You are finished. Do we have that today as well? You know, that people go in, they come only and attend divine service, and that's the most important service, and that's the divine service. Well, yes. By idolatry, superstition, whatever. And here they continue to say. The veneration and invocation of the saints. The first commandment continues. What does the Catholic Church teach as to the veneration and invocation of the saints? It's part of the first commandment. You have to invoke the saints. These are not strange to God. She teaches that it is right and wholesome to honor and invoke the saints. So the saints are in the first commandment. According to the Catholic Church. So those are not those are not strange gods. So you can honor them. So we can venerate them. What is the difference between the honor we show to God and that which we show and that which we show to God to the saints? Answer is, we honor God and pray to him as our sovereign Lord. He is the faithful servant and friends. We all... So, these ones are part of the commandment. So you should honor the saints because they are the friends to God. Now, do you see why God says God, but they change and say they shall not have strange gods because these are God's friends. And then we can honor them. We honor God for what should, on the account of the gift. So here they say, but we honor the saints on which they have received from God. So the honors that are coming from God, we can now also venerate the saints and adore them because they have received some honor and we need it. This is insane. What should be our chief object in honoring the saints? Remember, this is still the first commandment according to Catholicism. To become like them, okay? And it is part of God. It's part of 
thou shalt have no other gods before me then, it means if you want to become like them and they are part of uh, gods, then by imitating their virtues in order to share hereafter, What is the difference between our prayers to God and those to, with God? So there is not only one intercessor between Christ and uh, and uh, between God and the, uh, and man. There are many intercessors. Whom should we honor in an in an especial manner above all the angels and saints? Now listen carefully. There is some other honor that is placed above the angels and all the saints. Who is that? The answer is the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. Oops. So she's part of the first commandment she should be honored and, and and above all the saints and even the angels this is can you imagine breaking god's law openly that's why this system is is called the man of sin it's a sin it's a it's a it's a it's a low uh, lawlessness system Should we honor the images of Jesus Christ as a saint? Yes, certainly. I wouldn't not want to go into this. Now, let's see what they say. This is observatory. He is there for not only Pope, but the King of Kings, head of humanity and of the world. So he is the God. So he is the Father. That's why he's called the Father. The Pope, by divine right, has spiritual and temporal power as supreme king of the world. That is, uh, Romanism as, as world power. Luther S. Kaufman wrote that. We declare, define, and pronounce that it is essential to the salvation of every human being that he be subject to the Roman pontiff. Okay, so now humanity has to go under the Pope. Mm. Okay. To make war with the Pope is to make war against God, seeing as the Pope is God, capital, and God is the Pope. So now, when they say you shall have no, you shall not have no strange gods before me, and it is capital, then the Pope is not a strange God. According to Catholic doctrine, So he's God. And this is already breaking the first commandment. So the existence of the Pope himself is a breaking of God's law. So the, the, the sure deal that this system is, is anti-Christ and it is anti-God because it breaks the first commandment just by the presence of the Pope. Now, Matthew 23, 9. Look at this man. He's called the most holy father. But Matthew 23, 9 said, And call no man your father upon the earth. For one is your father, which is in heaven. Look at him. He's called the father. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. <coughs> so he is holy father. And all the, these two titles belong to God alone, breaking the first commandment openly. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Pope Leo the Thirteen said that. Rome as it is, page 180, given in Rome from our palace, the 10th of February, 1817, the 14th jurisdiction of the most holy pontiff 
and the Father in Christ and our Lord, our God, the Pope Leo the, the, 12th, the, the 12th. So Pope Leo XII was crowned uh, God according to, the, to them. So he is God breaking already the first commandment. Now, let's just have a look because if all will come and worship, let's have a look at this video and see what it has to say. There was reconciliation in the air in St. Peter's. Centuries of division were rolled away when Pope Francis greeted Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew from Istanbul during the inaugural mass. Such a meeting has not taken place since what is known as the Great Schism, which split Western and Eastern Christianity in 1054. 34 world leaders had attended the mass and delegates from 132 countries were present, while the Vatican said six sovereigns... There was reconciliation in the air in St. Peter's. Centuries of division were rolled away when Pope Francis greeted Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew from Istanbul during the inaugural Mass. Such a meeting has not taken place since what is known as the Great Schism, which split Western and Eastern Christianity in 1054. 34 world leaders had attended the Mass and delegates from 132 countries were present, while the Vatican said six sovereigns had made the trip to Rome, including from Belgium and Monaco. Six sovereigns. One of the first greetings was for the president of Italy, Giorgi Napolitano. An Italian cardinal had been one of the strong favorites to succeed Benedict XVI before Pope Francis was elected. Crown Prince Philippe of Spain and his wife were among those the Pope greeted. Philippe was one of three crown princesses who was present. There were no invitations sent out. All who wanted to be there were, said the Vatican, warmly welcomed. There was a brief chat with Robert Mugabe and his wife. The president of Zimbabwe is a devout and Catholic. Behind him, in line and waiting to meet the Pope, leaders from the European Union, from where President Mugabe is barred for alleged breach of human rights. The Vatican is a sovereign state outside the EU, and so he was free to travel to the inaugural Mass. The Vatican had made it clear no one would have privileged status or be refused. Joe Biden, the Vice President of the United States, had made the journey. <coughs> Throughout the brief meetings, as with the foreign minister for Iran, Ali Akbar Salehi, Pope Francis was relaxed in what was his first taste of handshake diplomacy. Speaking afterwards, British cabinet minister Baroness Varsi, who was at the mass, said the Pope will remain neutral in the row between Britain and Argentina over the Falkland Islands. Her comments came a day after the president of Argentina, Christina Kirchner, met the Pope and said he could help promote okay. dialogue so between London and Buenos Aires. Nations coming and bowing before him, and it's interesting that the Pope bowed before Mugabe. It's not Mugabe who bowed. It is a pope that bowed before Mugabe. So Mugabe is more experienced in Jesuitism than, uh, than the pope. So uh, if you noticed that the president, and they said that it is a sovereign state. So in other words, can, no one can be banned from going to Rome. So even Mugabe had been banned in Europe to travel, but he, he was allowed to travel to the Vatican. That tells you that this man may be his, is the god of all these nations. We saw that forgiveness of sin is part of breaking the first commandment because it, it, only God can forgive sin. So if you, anyone says that he forgives sin, then he, he is becoming another god before God. A Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, Article uh, on the Pope, page 265 says, this judicial authority will even include the power to pardon sin. Okay? I have uh, this book. In fact, I have a hard copy. The, the Catholic Priest, page 78 to 79. You will seek and will find but one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell, the Roman Catholic priest. The priest not only declares that the sinner is forgiven, but he really forgives him. Okay, he, he does what? He really forgives him. So great 
is the power of the priest that the judgments of heaven itself are subject to his decision. So he is the God. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were, God with capital. And the vicar of God, capital. So when you look at these things, it tells us that this system itself breaks the first commandment openly right away. So anyone who goes into this system is breaking the first commandment. This is a uh, National Catholic Register uh, shows us how that the Catholic priest who changed Hollywood. Now, if the Catholicism is always anti the first law, it does not do believe the first commandment, it already breaks it, even it changes it, then whatever will be taught in, in Catholic uh, environment will have to break the first commandment, whether you like it or not. I came across a quote from the film director that who is said to have remarked, if you want to send a message, then use Western Union. Western Union was the first telegraph company. In other words, according to Capra, movies have no message. Finally, I came across the production code, also known as the Hayes Code. This code was voluntarily accepted by the film industry in 1930, a self-censorship that served for decades as a guideline for morality and ethics in American films. So if the church is now sending someone and is writing the code by which morality in movies is supposed to be more is supposed to be shaped. Do we expect any movie in, for, to be produced by Hollywood having anything to do with the first commandment? Nothing, not even one. As a Catholic who works in the media, I am still interested in the topic today. I recently became aware of the work of the American professor Stephen Warner. Van Bros, who was, who has been teaching religion and philosophy in St. Louisiana for 28 years and is also an expert of the Hayes Code. Together we wrote about how the code, which changed Hollywood, was based on a document, on a document written by an American Jesuit priest, Father Daniel Alozias Lord. So what every movie, whatever they write, the, the, the one who, who wrote the code by which we are going to see that to show you that nothing will be produced. All this, in fact, I would like to read this part because it's very interesting. Some producers discovered that they could increase the number of viewers by inserting stories about crime and they crossed social boundaries with a more open attitude towards sexual relationship, rocky dialogue, and sexual suggestive scenes to attract a wider audience. So a wider audience requires surely bringing all this. Most of these films were com comparable to what you can see in modern movies today. Okay, so they wanted to attract people to them. Father Lord, the original draft contained a, pre a preamble, uh, general principles, and 12 specific law. Okay, so one of the things he wrote was a crime at crimes against the law. That should be interesting. Look the the, the someone has right against the police and against the law, you know, all of this. And 
he wrote the general principles are 12. There is here in the set, vulgarity, obscene references, obscenity, co costume, dances, religion, all of these were supposed to be involved. Isn't this bringing all things together? The God here is different. And uh, the, this is an admission. Moreover, the public admission that the code was unnecessary controversy. That's why they had to pass, do these things as if it was not Catholic in order for people to, to, to take it away from the Catholic Church, that it is the author. Let's go to the Bible, Psalms 86, verse 8 to 10. Among the gods, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee. All nations are supposed to come and worship before God. So if today we see anyone who has all nations coming and bowing before him, what do you think? Let's look at this, the pop video, because it has some interesting stuff. La mayor parte de los habitantes del planeta se declaran creyentes. Esto debería provocar un diálogo entre las religiones. No debemos dejar de orar por él y colaborar con quienes piensan distinto. Confío en Buda. Creo en Dios. Creo en Jesucristo. Creo en Dios. Allah. Muchos piensan distinto, sienten distinto, buscan a Dios o encuentran a Dios de diversa manera. En esta multitud, en este abanico de religiones, Hay una sola certeza que tenemos para todo. Todos somos hijos de Dios. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Creo en el amor. Para difundir mi petición de... este mes, que el diálogo sincero So he showed that Jones and different minds, that does not matter. So you can have all the gods, the Buddhists, the what, the what. Problem. Allah has no problem. But question, did Allah bring you from Egypt? No. Did Buddha bring you from Egypt? No. Did Krishna bring you from Egypt? No. Then what kind of God is this that brings gods together and says you shall have no other strange gods before me? This is the Pope. The Pope is the one writing in that commandment that he is the God and all other gods you should not have that are strange. So he welcomes only those. So who could be the strange God he's talking about and his capital? It must be the God of heaven. We should not bring him close to him. And when you bring him, you will see. That's why he will punish everyone who will bring that God before him. On the second day of the week of prayer for Christian unity, Pope Francis met with a delegation of Buddhist monks from Cambodia. Your Holiness, this is my great honor uh, to be allowed to uh, have a meeting today to pay respect and to make our friendship closer. And I hope that our meeting today will bring peace. The theme of the meeting was ecological conversion, a theme that is dear to the Pope's heart. He described the topic as important due to the grave threats our human family and our planet are facing. Questo è un segno positivo della crescente sensibilità e preoccupazione 
per il benessere della terra, la nostra casa comune e per gli importanti contributi che if you don't finish all of it, ispirati. it already shows you that you bring all of these people and they call him his holiness. But the Bible says only God is holy. So by claiming to be holy and his, his holiness, I am the Lord thy God. It doesn't add the other part. Because he knows very well she has never been to Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me, so that but all others that are not strange, he welcomes them. Now, who is the God of the Vatican? Let's have a look at this. St. Peter's Square is the most well-known part of the Which Vatican. God? Listen carefully. But behind this famous colonnade lies an entire nation created to serve God and led by one man. Vatican City is a secluded state, shrouded in mystery. While its squares and museums are open to the public, most of the country is off limits to visitors. It's home to the Pope and the government he leads the Holy See. As leader, his power is absolute. After all, under Catholic doctrine, it comes directly from God. The Vatican's crown jewel is St. Peter's Basilica. Its nave covers five and a half acres, an area larger than an aircraft carrier. The artistic treasures inside draw millions of visitors each year. But little do those visitors know that what lies hidden beneath this temple to God is a city of the dead. Vatican Hill was a necropolis. The original culture before Rome was there was the Etruscan culture, and they had a god, like the pagan gods, called Vatica, and she was the goddess of the dead, the goddess of the underworld. And so the Vatican Hill was where she lived. That's a good name for a cemetery. Today, St. Peter's Basilica sits atop that ancient cemetery and some of the most sacred figures in Catholicism. Located directly under Michelangelo's dome is the entrance to a labyrinth of caverns where cameras are usually forbidden. It leads to perhaps the most valuable treasure in the Vatican. Cardinal Angelo Camastri, the archpriest who runs the basilica, takes us through its grottos and into the confessio a sacred area normally restricted to the highest ranking members of the church. Inside is a clue that connects to Jesus himself. Siamo al centro della basilica. Siamo sotto il baldacchino del Bernini. Siamo sotto la cupola di Michelangelo. Ancora vedete il simbolo tipico di San Pietro che è la croce rovesciata. So who is the, the god the goddess Vatica? From where you get Vatican. In fact, even some say Vatican. Vatican is Vatis uh, and Khan, which is a divining serpent. Of course, if you connect very well, Vatican and Vatica are the same. In fact, the, the Roman, the Vatica is a Roman. The equivalent in Greece would be uh, the, the, the god of medicine, whom we saw last time and uh, is, the, is the equivalent that's why he has a snake or serpent on and why did rome choose real worship there's nothing to do with it. they want death so everyone who goes into the dead is going to worship another god of death not the god of, of the living our god is a god of the living this system is very evil and should be avoided. Now, this was a survey that was made to ask people, do we worship the same God? Listen to what they said, or look, as they asked them. When, when you say Allah, yeah. God, is it the same God as for the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims? For sure. He's the only one. 
האם כשאומרים אלוהים, או אומרים אללה, הערבים, או הנוצרים אומרים God, אם זה אותו אלוהים? מוסלמים ודאי. כן. נוצרים, אין לי מושג. אתה לא יודע. בגלל ישו? בגלל העניין של ישו? או אתה פשוט לא יודע? לא יודע, אני חושב שזה עניין של עבודה זרה, נוצרים יותר בקטע של עבודה זרה. כאילו, אני מסביר לזה שצופים, בגלל ישו נחשב גם אלוהים, נכון? לא, גם מוחמד נחשב, מוחמד נחשב הנביא. הוא נביא, הוא לא אלוהים. לא, אין לי מושג בישו. You Christian, Benny? Yes, I'm Christian. Okay, so the question to Christians is, when you say God, when you pray, is it the same God for Jews, Christians, and Muslims? Yeah, I pray for everybody. No, but is the God the same God for yeah, Muslims, yeah, yeah, for Jews, the, and for Christians? Yeah, yeah. It's the same God for all. Okay. Yes. Elohim, Allah. Is it the Elohim of Jews, Muslims, and Nazis? Allah is one. But it's the Jews who say Elohim, and you say Allah, it's the same one. It's the same one. And you don't need to think about something else. Elohim is only one. When people say God, Um, uh, Christians and Muslims say God. Is it the same God that the Jews believe in? Well, technically, I guess you can say it is. At the same time, we both believe in something higher than all of us. So I guess you can say that we both do believe in the same God, but you have different, different belief in what actually God is, I guess you can say. Yeah. You're Christians, right? <laughs> okay. Both of you. Come back, come back. Okay. So How can I help you? Okay. So, today. today. Uh, when you say God, Is it the same God in, for Christians, Muslims, and Jews? Is it the same God? Yes, the same. Yes, what? Yes, the same. The same. Okay. So how do you say in Arabic, God? You say Allah? Allah. She Nutsri or Muslimim, mitpalelim le Elohim. Zoto Elohim? Yeah, good to. Zoto Elohim. Elohim is Elohim. It's the same God. So. Now, if the commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, but Allah is not the God who brought anyone from Egypt. She wasn't there. She wasn't. Buddha never brought anyone from Egypt. Question. Now, if they all say it is the same God, isn't this breaking the first commandment intentionally? You shall have no other gods before me. Once I am there, there should be no other. I know that you'll, you'll want to, to bring them together, but this unity of religions is a Catholic understanding of putting God with other gods, which the Bible forbids. So this ecumenism is very dangerous. Revelation 14, 6-7. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heavens having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, a kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him, specifically, that made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of water. So it is specific which God they are talking about. You should worship the one who made the heaven and is the God of salvation and is the God of creation, a specific one, not all, all gods. So the commandment is strict. God knew that what Satan wants most is bringing truth and error together good and evil together. That's why it was easier to, for them to come at the knowledge of good and evil, or the true knowledge of good and evil, because they want to put them together. And this is the problem we have today. We have to first deal with bringing error and truth together. That is very dangerous. This first commandment deals and, and warns about ecumenism. God foresaw it and sent us a this business of the 
the Muslims are worshiping God, the whatever are worshiping God, and everyone is worshiping the same God. Is no sense. It is breaking the first commandment. May God guide us as we ponder upon those words. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for we, for our minds are very lower than yours. And we pray that you may enlighten us in your law, because every time we study it, it is new. That's why you told us to teach our children your law all the day. Because they are going to be treated for the kingdom of heaven. What we do is to is to make us put you and something else. Because he knows we can. Mind, us help us Lord to avoid this mindset and other things on the same level. And may you help shine in the world. I'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen.